Hey, hello everyone, and a very warm welcome to this month's Cray webinar. Um, it's really lovely to see so many of you joining us today. Um, for those of you who are new to Cray and a refresher to those who are more familiar with us, my name is Laura Crane and I'm the Interim Director of Cray. And Cray is the Centre for Research in Autism and Education, which is based at UCL's Institute of Education in London in the UK. And at Cray, our goal and our ethos is to conduct autism research, but really importantly, we aim for our research to be on topics that matter to autistic people and their allies, and which actually make a difference to autistic people's day-to-day -day lives. And we feel that one of the best ways to try and achieve that is to meaningfully involve the autism community in designing, in developing, in conducting and in sharing research. So we take a very participatory approach in all that we do. And we're also very committed to making sure that academic research on autism is shared beyond academia and that everyone can engage with both our work and also that of other research teams in a really engaging and accessible way. And that's one of the reasons that we set up this Cray webinar series to showcase some of the work of leading autism researchers and advocates in, a, um, in the field to an audience that will include, but also goes beyond academia. And at this point, I'd like to say a particular thank you to our funders, our supporters and our team members who make all of these events possible and particularly to the Pairs Foundation who really generously support our work at Cray and without whom these events really wouldn't be possible. So that's a little about our centre and about our values and now we move on to welcoming our really wonderful speaker and Cray alumnus Dr Alyssa Alcorn. Alyssa currently works at the University of Edinburgh as a postdoctoral fellow at the Salverson Mindrum Research Centre. But before this, we were extremely lucky to have Alyssa here with us at Cray. And when Alyssa was here, I really got to see firsthand just what a brilliant scientist she is. And I think the thing that stands out most to me was the number of times that schools got in touch and mentioned what a pleasure it was to have Alyssa and her team in their schools, which was really remarkable considering how much time and resourcing that data collection for that project took. So that's a real testament to Alyssa and her approach to research and working with schools. Um, but I also want to mention that Alyssa is simply one of the kindest and most thoughtful colleagues I've ever had the pleasure of working with. And perhaps of most relevance to this webinar, she's also a really phenomenal communicator of science. And especially for that reason, we're really pleased that she'll be speaking to us today about the Lean Study that she's been working on in Edinburgh. Now, if um, at any point the members of our audience have questions for Alyssa, you can either put these in the chat box, or if you prefer to, prefer to post your questions anonymously, you can use a website called Slido. And the link to the Slido website for those who want to use it should be going in the chat box very shortly. So thank you again, Alyssa, for delivering our Cray webinar this month. And we really look forward to your talk. And thank you very much, Laura, for, for an exceptionally warm welcome. Um, so that was give, give me a few tears in my eyes to get started here. Um, all right. So I think I'm ready to go ahead and get started if that's all the housekeeping. OK, so let me share my PowerPoint. All right. So uh, as Laura mentioned, I'm going to talk today about the LEANS project, and that stands for Learning About Neurodiversity at School. And my, my title today is, what does it mean to teach about neurodiversity at school, and how can we do that? And this is meant to be an overview talk of the LEANS project and resource pack. It's really a bit of storytelling in terms of how this project got to be where it is now, nearly at the end. Oops, and I'm clicking the arrow keys to go on. There we go. So this is this is not my work alone. I'm part of a larger team. We have both our research team there at the top, but also our educator participatory design team. I don't know if any of you are in the audience today, but if you are, a very extra warm welcome to our participatory designers. 
Um, throughout the talk, you'll see our amazing illustrations from Claire Hubbard. And of course, there are many, many more people beyond these who've been involved with the project. So before I get into serious storytelling mode, I'm gonna give just a little bit of context about what Leans is. So it is a research project, but it is also the output of the project, which is a new free resource pack to introduce neurodiversity concepts to mainstream primary schools, focusing on that eight to 11 year old sort of end of primary school age group. And it's trying to teach both what neurodiversity and neurodivergence are, but also go beyond that and talk about, well, how, how do those facts, those concepts impact people's school experiences? And this is meant to be a teacher delivered program that the entire class does together, trying to upskill everybody. So when, in terms of what I'm gonna to cover today, this is an overview talk. Um, and overview is usually academic code for, I'm going to skip, skip a lot of the steps and leave out a lot of the details because otherwise I won't be able to tell you the whole story, starting with what is neurodiversity and why might we wanna teach about that, our design process, what's actually in the resource pack we're producing, and a bit about the evaluation study that's been going on in schools this fall. So first, a little bit about neurodiversity. And it would be easy to give an entire talk just on this. So you'll need to forgive me for, for galloping through and just hitting a few key points. So when we're introducing neurodiversity to kids, the short definition that we developed and have used through the resource pack is neurodiversity means that we are all different in how we think, feel, and learn because our brains process information differently. Neurodiversity includes everyone because everyone has a brain. And it really tries to uh, position this in terms of other lessons about diversity that children might already be familiar with in school. For example, like talking about religious diversity and emphasizing that there's not one right or normal way to be. Now for the adults, of course, we can go a little bit further here in that we might, if we take a neurodiversity perspective, be thinking about distributions of traits across the human population, rather than talking about um, rigid categorical differences that have particular labels. And by the numbers in the statistical distribution, um, that majority would be neurotypical. And we might call neurodivergent people who are falling more at the tails of the distribution in terms of different traits. And we might then perhaps attach a diagnostic label um, or, or other label to a particular pattern of traits. But again, trying to get away from the idea of normal or correct brains or cognition. So it's, it's important to mark here that this is both a paradigm for conceptualizing differences, but also, of course, we've got the neurodiversity movement in lanes for this uh, child audience. We are focusing on introducing the concepts, but we are also asking people to take actions. So before we get to the action bit, why do we want to teach about neurodiversity anyway? Well, some people might say that because it's, it's there and we're not currently teaching about it in schools, that might be a good enough reason. But I think we could maybe go a bit further. And one reason might be that neurodivergence isn't rare. Scottish educational data and census data suggest we might be talking about approximately one fifth of people as neurodivergent. That's a lot even in, in one classroom, one street. However, on the Leans project, our big claim really is that neurodiversity concepts are a tool and we can do things with people's attitudes and actions using that tool that maybe aren't happening in other ways right now. So what kind of stuff am I talking about here? First of all, it's a good lens for reflecting on very diverse personal experiences of what it's like to be in school, to learn and to relate to the people around you. It provides an alternative and more positive or affirming explanation of things where now we might use explanations like someone is lazy, they're not trying, they're not interested, they're being naughty on purpose, particularly you might hear that one about children. And it's an alternative narrative then about why might people be struggling at school or have spiky profiles or just be doing and experiencing things differently to others. 
We can do even more with the idea of neurodiversity. Um, an important thing is around needs, which sometimes gets used as kind of a code word for something different or unusual or special treatment. But actually, everybody has things they need at school or in their workplace. But some people are having those needs met by how things are usually done. So it's kind of less visible. Neurodiversity also lets us give a non-arbitrary why answer to kids' understandable questions about why things might be happening differently for people at school or have apparently different rules and expectations. Finally, I think it also helps us um, convey the message that people don't owe you an explanation for their needs or their, their differences. You can't demand that of them but also you're not required to share about that part of you either, unless you want to. So with this idea of neurodiversity as a tool, it was a very early decision on the Leans project that we needed to get beyond the facts about neurodiversity. Because honestly, giving people a bunch of new definitions is not compelling for them to change their behavior or change how they think about things. So we summarize this as our no think and do goals. So the no goal was saying we want whatever this project produces to increase knowledge of neurodiversity terms and concepts. The think goal is we want to be creating more positive attitudes towards neurodiversity and neurodivergence. And finally, that do goal is about trying to increase individuals' positive and inclusive actions in their school community once they've been exposed to leans and compared to what they did before. So how did we actually start developing neurodiversity resources? It's worth checking in about the curriculum right now. And at least in the UK and Ireland, teaching about the concept of neurodiversity specifically is currently rare or absent altogether. Many teachers aren't very familiar with this concept and even if they've heard of it, there's a lot of confusion out there about how neurodiversity relates to terms like additional support needs or send or additional learning needs, all that kind of thing. It's, it's quite muddled up. However, there are a lot of really clear connections between neurodiversity and what schools are doing right now in their curriculum. For example, all of the work that's happening about inclusion, health, mental health, well-being, citizenship and human rights some schools are doing, and any other topics that have to do with human diversity. So it does fit in with what's happening now, even if neurodiversity itself is not yet being taught very much. So all of that means though, that there aren't any official standards yet or any obvious guidance out there for what a neurodiversity children's resource, classroom resource should actually include. So task number one then for the Leans project and the design process was to work out what could teaching neurodiversity realistically mean for this age group and how do we go about doing it? When Leans was funded, it was not funded to create a very defined output. It was pretty much funded with a blank sheet saying it's got to be a neurodiversity classroom thing for this eight to 11 age group. But we didn't know anything about what that might look like. So the goals of the participatory design process within Leans, the biggest one was to determine, well, what should we actually teach? Neurodiversity is a huge concept. Within that, what's the content and vocabulary for this age group? And also, how do we deliver it? Should we be making a game, a comic book, a website, a arts activity, a little of everything? Also, what are teachers going to need to know to deliver this topic, especially if it's new to them? and then exploring some of the ethics and risk ideas. There was also quite a few constraints when it came to getting started on this process. We needed a very high level of expertise for the people who are gonna be involved in the design process. They had to have both education experience and as far as possible, lived experience with neurodiversity and neurodivergence. Also had some, time, some slightly more boring constraints about time and money. How much can people do? How long can it take? How much do we have to pay people for their time? So there was actually quite a long phase of designing the design process and documenting it before we got started making anything. As I mentioned on the, the last slide, there was a lot of different types of decisions. 
What should we teach? What format? What about teachers? So it was quite challenging to move from having so many options in a big design space to making concrete decisions about what to do. So the very short summary of how we solved that problem was planning a very structured and thanks to COVID all online design process. We had multiple cycles, each focusing on a different topic area, such as kind of academics and classroom experiences was one topic area. But we also built in chunks of time that were dedicated for high level planning and also reviewing and reflecting on what we'd been deciding so far, kind of check it back against the big picture goals. So when we brought our team on board, um, we were advertising a very clearly defined role about what people were going to be asked to do and how it would fit into the whole means process. It wasn't an open sign up. We did ask people to express interest. It, it was a bit more like posting a job application basically, um, then had multiple members of the research team ranking forms to try to bring in a mixture across the team of different types of educational and uh, lived experience in different parts of the UK. So we ended up with a team of eight people who have been absolutely amazing. And again, if you are listening, any of you, thank you again so much and I love you all. So even then, once we had our team on board, we weren't ready to start quite yet. Um, we created a design team handbook that laid out as far as we knew how the process was gonna work, this structured design process I mentioned, and what different people were expected to do at different points. Everyone, including the researchers, also needed to sign a conduct agreement about our online sessions. So here's a very quick overview of what one of these design cycles looked like. So if we'd already narrowed down to a topic area for the cycle, such as friendship on this slide, people would start with an individual preparation phase. Um, they would receive a prompt, a fairly structured um, thing to look at that was trying to highlight what were some of the issues that we'd need to discuss and decisions we'd need to make about this topic. They could then do their individual preparation, write down ideas. Sometimes we use collaborative document editing and then would send it back to the research team. It was then a very, very quick turnaround in terms of trying to review and synthesize those team inputs do things like put together very similar ideas into a, a single proposal and get things ready for the team meeting. So team meetings were really meant to be decision focused. All the main idea generation was happening ahead of time. And the meeting was about weighing up the potential of different ideas and deciding um, which activity ideas, which content, which teacher guidance, you know, what, what seemed to be the best candidate stuff that came out of earlier in the cycle that we wanted to take forward. Again, this is the very, very quick lightning review version. There's a lot more details here. And I am gonna skip over those details to make sure that I have time to talk about the evaluation study at the end, because that's the new stuff that no one's heard yet. So by the end of these multiple uh, design cycles with members of the research team and the participatory design team, our big output at output at that stage wasn't stuff yet, but plans, the concepts, the vocabulary, outlines of classroom activities, teacher guidance needs, and a bunch more stuff about risks and ethics. Um, when we asked our design team to reflect on how this process worked, um, overall, they thought that it was fair, you know, that it was, it was fairly popular, partly because it was flexible, running online and fitting around people's other responsibilities. They did have suggestions for how to improve it. Um, one was asking for even more reflection time. Another thing was saying that the format where they got new information during the meeting and needed to decide on it immediately, that was a bit tricky. And we could have maybe done with an extra stage to sort of see the candidate options between those two points. Um, but overall, I think the fact that we were able to start with such a huge space of possibility and narrow down to some pretty concrete plans suggests that this design process was actually pretty successful. So in the nine months following the main design phase, we did a lot of other stuff. And one of those things was consultation studies, taking the draft materials such as they were, the outlines and plans, and speaking to different groups of people about what they thought, whether these would meet their needs, were they acceptable? 
We also made a decision to add a storytelling component to Leans as a way to help show more individual experiences and perspectives across different types of neurodivergent and neurotypical characters. So there was a certain amount of chopping and moving content. The big illustration phase happened and all the, the nitty gritty work of turning the plans into fully written out resources, the slides, the handouts, the lesson plans and the teacher handbook. So I've talked so much about this resource pack. What exactly is in there? What are our topics? What are our, what's the stuff? So the, the big picture summary here is that in the final resource pack, we have a set of 23 key points. And these are really the skeleton of the whole thing, summarizing the main concepts. In many ways, they function like learning objectives for pupils in terms of what we want people to know or understand by the time they've gone through um, this whole curriculum. We created multiple different types of resource items. There's hands-on activities that the class does, and there's reflective elements. We've got some explainer videos that give direct uh, definitions and talk about some of those new tricky terms. We've got posters, there's the stories, and all these different bits and pieces play complementary roles in terms of coming at neurodiversity from different angles. All of this content is then split up into seven topic units to make it easier to approach and deliver. So the main project output then, the biggest thing that we've made is what we've called the Lean's Teacher Handbook. And currently this is a huge messy Word document. It will become a beautifully professionally laid out book. And, and that has all of the guidance for teachers and then the lesson plans. And a lot of that content is about introducing neurodiversity to teachers who may be new to this topic and helping them get on board and feel prepared to teach about this topic in their classroom. So the seven units I mentioned are introducing neurodiversity, classroom experiences, communication, needs and wants, fairness, friendship, and reflecting on our actions. Hmm. So teaching about neurodiversity, it may not initially look like it's very much about neurodiversity. Some of this really looks like other stuff. And I'd like to explain that a little bit more. So to try to answer the question that I posed at the beginning, what do we think it means to teach about neurodiversity? And maybe it's better to ask that question in a different way, which is to get at experiences. So what are some of the ways that we think children in this age group, that eight to 11 group, are experiencing the implications of neurodiversity at school? The implications of having children of different neurotypes you know, working and, and playing together at school and in the classroom. And how do we get at those experiences? And the answer is probably not to go hard on the brain stuff and hammer on about neurons. It's not to say that there aren't gonna be any eight to 11 year olds who are interested in this, um, but it's probably not the most immediate way to get at those experiences. Instead, I'd like to throw out a few phrases you have probably heard from a primary schooler in your life. Like, that's not fair. Um, how come he gets to do that? It's your fault. You're doing it wrong. And you're not listening to me. An absolute classic. It's often some of these everyday confusions and points of conflict where some of those differences may come out in terms of what kids are caring about and experiencing during their school day. And in addition to those, we've got things like is it okay to ask for help? What about helping somebody else? And what do you mean you can't hear that noise that's making me, you know, that means I can't concentrate and you can't hear it? Comparing ourselves to others and also trying to come up with explanations for what we see happening around us. Um, oh, I think it's like that because it's all of this stuff, really, this nitty gritty, like little everyday stuff which is where some of those implications are really coming out. And that's why in the list of, of topics and as our team discussed over such a long time about what kids might care about and what they might wanna do, more and more content came out that was around things like fairness and how important that is 
the sort of everyday beliefs and feelings and running of the classroom. And that wasn't something that was in the original plan at all. So this really very organically developed as we went along. So here's a concrete example from one of the lean stories. And this is about using a computer, a word processing program as support for handwriting. And in the fairness unit, we hear about this character, Morag, who's one of our main characters. She has a dyspraxia uh, or DCD diagnosis. And in class, she's able to use a support that other people don't get to use, which is to use a computer for writing long assignments because she really struggles with the motor control of handwriting. So this is only available to her and not to her classmates because she has this handwriting challenge that other people don't. However, this leads to a certain amount of bad feeling in the classroom, a certain amount of whispering. Is it fair? Is it cheating? What's going on with this computer thing anyway? And eventually we see this situation come to a head when another student just loses it and yells how it's not fair and it's cheating that Mora can use the computer and nobody else can. So our teacher, Mr. Oliver, knows that he's got to, he's got to say something about this situation. He can't just move on from it. And he's really conscious about not wanting to draw more attention to Morag, who has already had another student yelling about her in class and is clearly just wants to sink into the floor. But it gets quite stuck in terms of how can he talk about this situation without drawing more attention to Morag. And we see a wonderful moment in the story where she suddenly realizes that she can kind of take some control of this situation. She realizes Mr. Oliver could explain about the computer to everyone right now. If the rest of the class knew the real reason, there would be nothing to whisper about. And they make eye contact across the room and she nods and kind of gives him permission to go ahead and talk about the computer and why she uses the computer. And this is in the fairness unit because um, it really gets at some of that tension sometimes that's there about how come certain people in class get to do things or go places or, or use things that other classmates don't. That can be a point of confusion, a point of friction. So one thing I'd like to say before moving on to our evaluation study is that there were many, many conversations in the uh, course of developing these resources about risk and about ethics. And I think that we all really believe that teaching about neurodiversity has a lot of potential benefits, but it's not a risk-free topic. We're talking about people's lives, um, almost certainly the lives of people who are right there in your classroom. It's a sensitive topic and you've got to act like it. One of the big things that did come up again and again was the potential problems around singling out individual real pupils in the class or things happening that made people feel singled out, even if that wasn't the intention. And that was a big driver behind having the stories is to give a shared frame of reference and be able to give specifics of different experiences that people are having, but without it needing to be about real people in your own class. Another big concern here was that a little knowledge can be ammunition, especially in a school setting that may have bullying problems or other uh, quite negative patterns of behavior between pupils or between staff. A little bit more knowledge about differences might fuel some of the problems that are already there. So one of the things that's in a teacher handbook is a, is a self-evaluation section that really does ask teachers and school leaders to pause and think carefully about the implications of teaching about neurodiversity at their school. If you do that, what kind of things might happen? And if there are problems, how well prepared are staff or pupils to constructively work on those problems? So I'm now gonna go into some new content, which is about our evaluation study this term. And I'm quite happy to say that this evaluation study was pre-registered. Um, there's a link there that I can also paste into the chat later. Um, so the evaluation study is really about trying to put together the lean schools with some specific does it work type goals. And again, we had our no think do goals that I mentioned at the beginning. We're trying to impart this more factual or vocabulary knowledge, what is neurodiversity, but we're also trying to influence people's attitudes, 
and the actions they might be taking or not taking in their school context. So the evaluation goals then are first to, uh, to release it into the wild in a controlled fashion to try to assess some of the acceptability and feasibility of the resource pack. And the point of doing that is so that we've got feedback we can use to update and improve those resources before they're released to the public. We also wanna check on some of that stuff over to the side about uh, the teaching neurodiversity concepts and about attitudes. Is it successfully teaching those concepts? Do we think that we've had any effect on attitudes? However, when it came to designing the evaluation, we had some big constraints. And one that I forgot to put on the slide at all here actually is that there aren't existing measures of neurodiversity knowledge, especially not for primary school age children. We were kind of starting over at the beginning with needing to create some kind of evaluation that fit the resource we had made and also fit a number of practical constraints. The biggest of which of course is limited class time and child attention spans. You just can't, people, can't ask people to do too much. It doesn't fit. Also, there's the issue around modality. If we have a very reading intensive or writing intensive evaluation, that is gonna disadvantage some pupils. And in this case, maybe disadvantaging some of the pupils who it's most important to hear from would be our neurodivergent pupils in the classroom. Unfortunately, especially given COVID, it's also not very feasible to try to directly observe the actions that people are taking in their school or how they might be putting their attitudes into practice day to day. We need a bit more of a proxy measure just because that's really what we're able to do with the resources that we have now and under health constraints. Also, of course, in, in education, we often use a pre-test, post-test design. What do you know at the beginning? Do you know more at the end? However, is that a bit pointless if we think people are likely to have zero knowledge of our concept, zero knowledge of neurodiversity ideas and terms at the beginning? It sounds like it could just be very frustrating to sit and have a whole page of questions about stuff you've never heard of. That's not the first impression that we wanted to give of Leans. So here's the solution that we developed. And if people really wanna ask about this in the questions, I've got a few more slides with details that I can pull up later. So we had a pre-test time point before teachers delivered the Leans curriculum, where we had a questionnaire focused on children's attitudes and actions around differences more generally. So none of those questions were relying on Leans specific information um, or neurodiversity terminology, except one critical item um, that asked children to try to choose the best definition of neurodiversity. Then we had the period of time where teachers were delivering the Leans curriculum in their class. Then we had a post-test time point where children saw the same attitudes and actions questionnaire so that we could compare across time points. And they also saw a new questionnaire which was about neurodiversity knowledge. This is the one where all of the Leans specific uh, novel terminology and concepts go on this questionnaire. We do also have some qualitative data collection that goes along with these, but I'm not gonna talk about that in detail today. Um, that one critical neurodiversity item then also appeared at the post-test as well. So in order to try to get around some of the modality issues, every child of course has their own printed quiz where they're marking their answer, but we also ask the teacher to read out the question and the answer options for each question to try to give everybody in the class the best chance at those questions. So we are still wrapping up the evaluation right now. It has been an absolutely hellish school term for all of our schools. And it is really incredible that they committed the time and effort to stick with this study. So if we've got anyone from our study schools listening, again, thank you so much for everything that you've done. We've had four schools part of the study. They are all in Scotland, which had to do with school calendars more than anything else, a mix of rural and urban schools and eight classes in total. And again, we had the teacher or co-teacher delivering leans to the whole class. Now, how we worked this with being a study in the questionnaires 
is that everyone in the entire class did the questionnaires as part of business as usual in the classroom, but parents could then opt in for their child's questionnaires to be shared with the research team. And if they did that, we then also asked them for some additional background information about their child, um, such as languages spoken, and whether or not they had any diagnoses that might be relevant, such as a dyslexia diagnosis, for example. So we don't have all the results back so far, but I can share a few bits from the classes that have already come in. So based on the pretest data, that neurodiversity critical item I mentioned, asking children to choose the best definition of neurodiversity on a multiple choice question, only 20% of them identified the correct definition at pretest, which is chance level if you've got five options. Lots of them just said, I don't know. However, the first three classes that we've entered from the post-test, 77% are now choosing the correct answer, which seems like quite an encouraging sign so far. And so we'll have to see if that holds up in the classes that are still coming in. We also had some delightful free responses. The very last two questions on one of the quizzes um, gave kids an opportunity to say sort of whatever they wanted. And the first question asked, about something that they learned from doing leans. And we just did some really, really nice and really varied answers here. And um, like, I learned a lot more about fairness. Not all neurotypical people are the same. We also had a second free response question that said to kids, what would you tell the people who made leans? Oh no, I forgot. We had this lovely, uh, this lovely suggestion as well people are different and shouldn't feel that they have to change. That was a really nice thing to see coming in on one of the quizzes. And again, in that, in that second free response question, we asked what they'd like to tell people who made leads. Um, I liked it, but it could have been shorter. Uh, actually, I noticed a pattern very quickly here in that we had a lot of responses that said something like, it was pretty good, but it was long, or there was a lot of listening. So um, guess who's asked for a pack of red pens for Christmas? We're working now on trying to make parts of it shorter, because that was, that was quite a clear bit of feedback from the kids. We also had some other suggestions, though. Um, this, it was really lovely to hear from someone said, please continue to teach children about neurodivergent people. So thank you again to everyone who's been part of the evaluation study um, and everyone who's still finishing up the study right now. So what happens after this? After the red pen editing stage I just mentioned, revising resources based on the feedback that comes in from the study, we're now working toward the resource release. And I think our current target is looking in the February, March time window. We have not set an exact release date yet. When I'm saying release, what that means is that the entire resource pack will be online for free, in full, worldwide, forever, all of those good things. Um, so everyone who's listening and thinking, oh, I'd like to have a look at that, you will be able to, um, but that's still a few months away. We're also starting to plan our launch events, one of which will be specifically targeted towards educators and schools. So if you'd like to make sure you hear about the resource release and um, about any events, please do join our mailing list. You can just drop an email to leans at ed.ac.uk. That same information is also on our project website. I'd like to say a very last note before ending, which is that while we've tried to do all we can with leans, we can't do everything. So no resource on any topic can cover every single possible bit or every viewpoint, and classroom time is already very crunched. So we are really trying to open up a conversation on neurodiversity for what might be the first time in some schools and classes, but this is never meant to be the last word on neurodiversity. We know other people are gonna come in with other things or build on it or contradict it or, or whatever. And that's fine, that's good. So not the last word, but we have worked very, very hard to, to bring this resource to fruition. So thank you again 
very much to everyone involved with the project and to all of you for coming to my talk today. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so, so much, Alyssa. That was a really amazing talk. And it's not just me saying that as your biggest fan, but if you have a look in the chat box, you'll see some really wonderful comments um, from members of our audience saying how much they enjoyed it and what a brilliant, brilliant project it was. Um, we have had um, some brilliant questions come in. Um, if anyone else would like to ask um, a question to Alyssa, um, please do use um, Slido. The link is in the chat and we'll try to get through as many questions as we can. We're going to start off um, with a question from actually the wonderful person who's given our next Cray webinar. So this is a question from Kathy Ledbitter, who said, fabulous talk. Thank you so much for this work. Um, and Kathy comments that the primary curriculum is already very jam packed with lots of competing priorities and never enough time. So if a teacher wanted to do just one or two short lessons on neurodiversity, could this help them? So could they do one or two modules, for example? And might it be something that could be used in Key Stage 2 assemblies, for example? So is it possible to take little bits as opposed to having to do the whole curriculum? Is that something that you've considered? So that's a, that's a good question. And I'm sure it is not the last time we'll hear a similar question. And based on going through the whole development process, we are strongly encouraging people to sign up for the whole package, basically, to work through all of the steps. Of course, we know that teachers are going to be picking what they think works best for them, but the teacher handbook does try to spell out quite clearly why we very strongly recommend that people do the whole curriculum in full, um, probably spread out over a whole term, but it could be over a whole school year, um, because there are, the bits are all written to fit together. Um, if people did just want to perhaps give that neurodiversity definition and move on, one of our short videos that's a resource is what we call the, the neurodiversity explainer. I think it's about 10 minutes long um, and a teacher might do better to perhaps pull that and, and build something around it. But we've been really concerned not to be misinforming people about neurodiversity because I think there's a lot of opportunity for quite reasonable misunderstandings about what this concept means. Um, yeah, but we, we really are encouraging people to, to invest in it. And I hope that by making links to topics that we know schools already care about and are prioritizing like inclusion or health and well-being, um, that they might be putting teachers in a stronger position to make a case for why it's supporting a number of different aims to spend time on neurodiversity curriculum. Totally, and just thinking, so if a school implemented the curriculum in say um, a class of eight to nine year olds, but they wanted to kind of recap and revisit something in year six, are there kind of additional resources that they could kind of dip into perhaps once they've implemented everything? Um, ooh, I'm not sure I've had that exact question before. Um, I think that some of the reflective exercises might be worth revisiting later on and could be a good jumping off point for a discussion. For example, in unit three, which focuses on communication, we ask pupils to do a kind of structured reflection on types of communication that might be harder or easier for them. That's, that's the natural version. There's a bit more to it. But something like that, you could certainly revisit at a later point. Um, or there's an exercise that asks the class to look at class agreements or rules, if they have any, and to make commitments about things that they want to change, or it could be sort of an individual level making a commitment. So that kind of revisiting where we are on our commitments about how we're, how we're treating each other or things like that, that's, that's the first thing that, that's coming to my mind. Um, we also, alongside the resource pack, are providing a crowdsourced list of suggestions of books and websites and videos and all kinds of stuff. Um, so that would be another place to go, perhaps reading some of the books on the list um, or giving children a choice. Many of them are sort of at like a children's chapter book 
level, so could probably do some independent reading at that age. Yeah, however, we, we only have so much resource to make those extension suggestions. It's we're doing well to finish the main thing and get it out there. <laughs> you know how that is. Yeah, no, but I think that's a really nice idea, just, you know, having children to have the opportunity to see neurodiversity and also other types of diversity just represented throughout in the books that they're reading or the worksheets they're doing in other um, lessons as well. That's brilliant. Thank you. And um, we have another question that kind of links, which is not more about how do teachers who want to implement it fit it in, but actually how do you get schools on board with implementing it in the first place and including neurodiversity within their curriculums? Well, so far, this hasn't actually been a super hard sell in that we've had, you know, I've received emails literally from around the world of people saying, we want to do something in our school or my child's school. But obviously, that's not going to be everyone. And I think that, again, making a very... detailed argument in terms of your local school requirements or goals or inspection frameworks might be the way to go. Obviously, that's going to look different even across the different UK nations in terms of exactly what words are going to be in that argument, but drawing, drawing connections between what's in that curriculum with what, um, what the school is trying to do within their local expectations. And this is not gonna be the right choice for every school immediately. For example, in a school that currently is not doing a lot of work with inclusion or with uh, mental health or something like that, or, or doesn't do any other diversity topics in their teaching, maybe this isn't the right thing to start with. There might be a couple of steps that they might need to invest in before taking on a topic like Lean's. Absolutely. Um, we have a question that's come in and I guess one of the things that we've got to remember, this is a great question, but I guess, you know, this is your starting point, but this is something I think would be as a parent who has navigated home learning and had to learn a lot about the things my children were covering in their curriculum. Someone has asked, does your curriculum include parent handouts so that parents could learn a bit about what neurodiversity is to support the learning that's taking place at school or might that be something for the future? So with our again needing to parcel out resources carefully currently we wrote kind of a draft letter of the type that teachers might send home to say guess what new topic coming up in our class um, with the hope that teachers would be more likely to send it home if all they have to do is like stick a school logo on it and spruce it up a bit for their, their local conditions. Um, that is really, as far as we have committed to right now, just because of having to make time and resourcing decisions, we're hoping very much that we may be able to secure some further funding for some more parent-facing stuff, including resources that parents might be able to use if they want to go to their child's school and say, I think it could be important and beneficial for the school to do this and here's why. But again, that does require some more resources. So fingers crossed, we might be able to, to bring in that funding. Brilliant. We've had another question in. First of all, saying um, thank you for an absolutely brilliant talk. And the question is about the specifics of the Lean study, which I think you touched on, but it might be helpful to clarify. So whether the curriculum runs over three years, if it's years four to six, how long each session. So I think you said a term but is it that it can be implemented any time over those years? So the target age that we were designing for was roughly P5 to P7 or year ages 8 to 11. It's not meant to be repeated over and over in that time, but it would probably be appropriate at, at any point in that age range. Our suggestion is over a term, but it would be up to teachers if they want to spread it out more. The units and activities vary in how long they are, so I can't give a specific answer. We also are, as I mentioned, revising and trimming a lot of content right now, so I don't have kind of the final answer about exactly how much there is till I finish the editing process. Brilliant, thank you. 
Um, another question's come in, first of all, again, saying what an absolutely brilliant talk, um, but also about the age ranges. They, they've said that um, they know you're thinking of adapting leans for secondary school students. And in doing that, will you involve students in the design process? What kind of things will you kind of be thinking about if you do take it forward to that next step? So I see that someone has been reading our mailing list, perhaps, if they know about that. Thank you. Um, we've Since we started, we've had people saying, that's great, where's the secondary school version? Um, right now we're at the stage, even before applying for money, of trying to decide, can we adapt the liens that we have, or would we really need to start over for an older age group? From the first groups of educators we've talked to, it seems like there probably are chunks that we can adapt and other new bits that would need to be made from scratch. So if we were to get as far as applying for funding for a lean secondary, we probably would be pitching an idea of having um, an educator participatory design group similar to the one that I mentioned in this project, but also a group of young people um, we're really not far enough along to have thought in any detail about exactly what that might look like, whether we'd be hoping to involve individuals online or a group at a couple of physical school sites or, or what exactly. But I think at that age, it would, especially because young people's cultures and concerns and how they're communicating with each other changes so rapidly. Um, all of us adults are sort of fossilizing a bit and aren't necessarily good at keeping up with with all of that. So it would be extra important to be hearing from them about what they, you know, what they care about or not and what the best way to share this information might be. So Zoom, we've had another question that's come in um, about um, whether, so quite linked to what you were just discussing, but whether neurodivergent children have had the chance to comment on the project and particularly how they feel about the stories and discussing neurodivergence in class. So this was a place where plans changed several times on the project, all of which has been carried out during COVID and lockdowns and everything, which changed a lot of people's research plans. So there has been some feedback, but it's been fairly limited from, from small numbers of children. One of my colleagues has been following up now um, as the class has finished the evaluation study, doing a small number of follow-up interviews with neurodivergent pupils specifically to ask them about some of these types of issues. Um, I can't, I don't know exactly what they've been saying because that's still happening right now. Um, we would have liked to do more if we had more time and resources and everyone wasn't on lockdown. But as it is, it was very strategically trying to get just enough feedback to see if we, it seemed feasible to keep going with the type of thing we were doing. So you, you say that you had to put constraints and couldn't do too much, but actually you have done an enormous amount. And definitely from the comments that we've had in the chat, I think everyone's been hugely impressed by what you've managed to achieve. But I th also think about the kind of thoughtfulness and the sensitivity with which that this has been carried out. Um, we've had a really good question come in about um, whether or how you inform teachers about the fact that there are most likely um, unrecognized pupils with different neurodiversities in their class. So, um, you know, they might not have a diagnosis yet and the teacher may not realize um, that they're neurodivergent. Has that come up in any of your... Um... Yes, yes, we have talked about this a lot. And this is, this is personally one of the things I like most about the idea of neurodiversity and taking it to school is because we know there's often this very scraping, miserly diagnostic gatekeeping going on um, that keeps changing the goalpost for who do we think needs support or has a problem or whatever. Um, and neurodiversity, you can, no, there's no rules about who gets to say that they identify as being neurodivergent. And it also means we don't have to wait for somebody to have a diagnosis to talk about, well, what is that person like? And what is their school experience? And are there, you know, what are, what are their strengths and challenges and needs and can we do do anything to make their school experience better. So the handbook does say from the very, very beginning, 
we want to talk to everybody in your class and there will almost certainly be children who are experiencing difficulties of some kind in the school environment who may not have a diagnosis and we want you to know that we are talking to those kids too and we have one of our main characters in the story um, Simon who we see that he has clear uh, difficulties with reading and and writing um, he's very resistant to accept help. He doesn't want to have this conversation with his teacher until the very end of the stories. Sorry, I've spoiled it for everyone now. Um, but but he's he's a child who does not have a documented diagnosis and is kind of struggling quietly on on his own. We we really get inside his head in the stories about like why does he not want to talk to anyone? What makes him eventually change his mind and say yes to a teacher's offer of help? Um, so that was a that was an important planning ingredient from the beginning is that there's going to be children who don't have a diagnosis and never have may never have a diagnosis. Um, but the idea of neurodiversity can still say something practically useful to them in their lives. We've had some questions come in about when you'll start rolling the project out in schools, whether you have a target for when it will become readily available, whether people can access parts of the curriculum yet. And one of the things that you mentioned earlier in your talk was that you did pre-register the study, and I see that you've got something on the open science framework, but would you be able to talk a bit about kind of what is available that people can have a look at and when hopefully things will become more widely available? Um, this is a this is a pretty short answer here is nothing is available yet except the pre-registration which is not of the entire project it is the evaluation study only so the pre-test post-test bit with the questionnaire so you can go there and you can see some more details about what happened in the study and see actual copies of the questionnaire but everything else will be made together as a lump um, in the spring again we're currently talking about dates in February, March. It's possible it might take a little longer, but everything will be released together. And again, it will all be free for everyone worldwide. Fantastic. And if people don't already know, there is a really wonderful mailing list that you can sign up to for the Leans project as well. I am on that mailing list. And it's, again, a brilliant example of how to communicate the different stages of the project and what's going on and presumably the mailing list will be the very first to hear when those resources are available and I think there'll be yes, yes. Of interest um, in that. So I wondered if I could quickly pick up a question I've seen come through in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, someone asked is there a plan to ensure that schools should be mandated to deliver this yeah. and we've had a couple people ask about this and Personally, I'm really not in favor of this idea and would actually campaign hard against that. And I know that might be kind of a surprising answer. I really do think that there is some potential for harm in teaching about neurodiversity, especially in schools that may not previously have taught any topics that are much like this before, may not be particularly prepared to deal with issues that come up, or schools where there might already be a bullying problem. Because I know we've we've talked to teachers who've said, oh, well, we've got such and such going on. Maybe leans would be a good thing to do. And it's not meant to be a, a silver bullet or a band-aid for a perceived problem that's happening anywhere. I think it would be quite easy for, for teachers or schools to maybe go, ah, maybe we can solve our problems with this when that might be an unrealistic or even a potentially harmful expectation and for some of the vulnerable pupils in their school. So as I, as I mentioned, the handbook includes a self-evaluation section, asking teachers to think pretty carefully about the circumstances in their class and in their school before choosing to adopt this. That's why I would say I'm really not sure that a blanket mandate to teach leans or teach anything about neurodiversity is necessarily the safest choice. Brilliant. Thank you for that, Alyssa, because I think you really sold it to us, but actually it is important to think very much about the school context and what works for each individual school and for the pupils in that school. So I think that's a really helpful point to reflect on for anyone thinking of when it gets released, 
implementing liens within their setting. So we are at five o'clock now, which brings us to the end of this Cray webinar. I just want to say a huge thank you again to Alyssa for a really, really brilliant talk. Um, a huge thank you to the Cray team for all of your support behind the scenes. And a big thank you to everyone who's joined us today. Um, please do take a look at our website, cray.ioe.ac.uk, for details of future webinars featuring a host of amazing um, researchers and advocates. And our next webinar is by the brilliant Cathy Ledbitter of the University of Manchester. And Cathy's talk is about an evidence-based, ethical and person-centred care pathway for autistic children and their families. And Cathy's talk will be on Thursday, the 13th of January at 4 p.m. UK time. We really hope to see you there. Thanks very much, everyone.